I think this technology is so important. We need to invite a young generation of all walks of life, especially those who are traditionally underserved and underrepresented, need to hear that they have a huge role to play. Welcome to Ask More of AI, the podcast looking at the intersection of AI and business. I'm Clara Shai, CEO of Salesforce AI, and I'm excited to be here today with Dr. Fei-Fei Li, the inaugural Sequoia Professor of Computer Science at Stanford and co-director of Stanford's Human-Centered AI Institute. She came out with a new book last week, The World I See, Curiosity, Exploration, and Discovery at the Dawn of AI. Dr. Li, it's such an honor to have you on the podcast. Thank you, Clara, for inviting me. You look like you're at Stanford. Is that your office? Yes, this is. Uh, I'm right uh, in the Gates Building, Computer Science Building, and lots of robots are around me right now. <laughs> I have many fond memories there, although I don't think there were as many robots roaming around when I was there. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have so much to cover today, um, but I, I just wanted to start. I mean, one of the you're 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 so well known for so many incredible contributions in the field of AI and in, for society at large. Um, but one of the ones that I wanted to start with was what you've done in the vision arena, and specifically with ImageNet, which led to AlexNet, which really has become the foundation for deep learning and the, the large foundational models that we're all talking about now. Can you take us back in time to 2007, 2008, 2009? What gave you the, the idea for ImageNet, and, and what made you have that hunch that it was really about having more parameters and more data, that that would really be the unlock for deep learning? The beginning of this is that I was in AI as a as a student at the turn of the century. And for the public, that's probably considered an AI winter because nobody was talking about AI. But for those of us in this field, we were deeply, deeply curious and uh, hoping that uh, one day machines will become intelligent and help people to do a lot of work and all that. And uh, around that time, the the world of computer science has discovered um, machine learning as a very important tool, mathematical tool in model uh, ideas like for pattern recognition and all that. Um, but it's also around that time that the internet has happened. What happened to internet is it brought us a lot of data. So in 20, uh, 2006, 2007, I was uh, in my first year as a young assistant professor and um, I was working on a very important AI problem, which is making machines to see. And when you want to make machines to see, which is a cornerstone of intelligence, you want it to see objects because that's how intelligent um, agents like humans uh, begin understanding the world is by understanding the objects and, and navigating and eventually manipulating and interacting with it. But that's a hard problem. Um, our field has been working on it for a while. Um, but we're working on very small data, like hundreds or thousands of images, and um, a couple of dozen types of objects, like cats, dogs, microwaves, and all that. Yes. And it was just very unsatisfying. And uh, my student and I had a moment of epiphany is really... Um, uh, about, it's a mathematical insight as well as an intuitive insight, which is that learning should be driven by data. And um, that was not the, the, the accepted view in the field at that time. The, the more accepted view in the field of that time is spending a lot of time handcrafting uh, models that can you can tune parameters with. And we, we, we gain this insight from observing how humans, little humans learn in seeing. That's a lot of experience with the world. And also recognizing mathematically, that's how we can drive the problem towards generalization and avoid overfitting. These are mathematical jargon words. But that's really the beginning. And we decided to be a little crazy and do an internet scale project on collecting data set to uh, image that to drive uh, machine learning of visual intelligence. And then we open sourced it to the whole world. When we finished that uh, in 2009, we started um, 
to call on an international competition for ImageNet, we call it ImageNet Challenge. And in 2012, Professor Jeff Hinton in Toronto and his students um, and it, it participated in this challenge and used neural network algorithm um, uh, with, with the ImageNet and won that year's competition. And many people call that year the beginning of the modern AI revolution. Just incredible. So you came up with this idea, you had this epiphany, you create then the largest data set of images from the inter internet, ImageNet, you open source it, you launch this competition to see what AI researchers can do with this data set. And you know, prior to, to 2012, what were the other approaches that, that weren't as effective? What, what did people try at first? Uh, there are actually some beautiful mathematical models, whether it's support vector machines or Bayesian net or, you know, conditional random field. I mean, we can geek out on these different <laughs> uh, different models. They are beautiful mathematical models. A lot of them are still being used in different various cases. It's just that with this kind of data-driven, uh, data first approach, you need high capacity models like neural network. And neural network is an old family of models. In fact, it was discovered, uh, it was invented starting 1950s, 60s, and then, uh, you know, uh, improved along the way. So the, the particular model that was used for ImageNet uh, at the beginning was a convolutional neural network model was proposed in uh, 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, but it gave it the, the data first approach, gave it a new life. And till then, you know, we fast forward to 2022, chat GPT is built upon large amount of data. So this data first approach is still very much central to today's AI. It really unleashed an entire new era. And we're just starting to see the fruits of that labor. Um, just so inspiring. So, so AlexNet, they won this competition and they won by a, a fair margin. And they, they really took, you know, I think they, they took consumer hardware, right, to be able to do this and, and to, to find the GPUs to, to run yep. the, the neural networks, and they won the competition. Yes. Uh, I think the convergence of three critical ingredients, right, GPU, uh, ImageNet or data, and uh, algorithm, in this case, neural network, these three core ingredients ushered in the, the new modern AI era. It's incredible. So now we fast forward 11 years later, which is where we are now. And, you know, we just saw DALI-3 come out and GPT-4 is multimodal and can scan vision prompts. Um, what's the state of the, the art today when it comes to, to vision? I think you are in industry, you are seeing incredible multimodal models. Is right now it's led by um, uh, GPT 4V. Uh, you also see Meta releasing incredible model like STEM and Segment Anything. Uh, you, you, uh, the state of vision is that I think, it, uh, and then you start to see these uh, 3D models like Nerf and all that, is that it really has blossomed. We're in the uh, um, we're in a Cambrian explosion of uh, models. Uh, my dream, you know, when I enter grad school is to make machines recognize objects in pictures. Now we have far past it. We can uh, reconstruct 3D objects. We can uh, uh, recognize, you know, human movements. And you see this in application. For example, self-driving car industry would not be um, uh, still on the rise if it's not computer vision. You know, that 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 is a bedrock of self-driving car industry. Um, and uh, in many other industries, whether you're talking about healthcare or, you know, uh, climate and, and, and many things that consumer may not even be aware of, computer vision is a fundamental technology. So, of course, there's been a lot of talk about transformer architectures and how game-changing it is. But that's, that's not the only architecture that's out there. You know, depending on the modality, whether it's vision, video, 2D, 3D, other models like diffusion models might make sense. You know, can you, can you explain for our business audience what the, the, the key use cases are for different types of architectures? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the 
Transformer models is still a very, very powerful model, um, you know, for, for multimodal. Uh, I think we don't know all the details of, uh, of uh, uh, say, OpenAI's GPT-4V, but it's still based on uh, most likely uh, transformer models with tokenized uh, information. Um, there are other models depending on the different problem. For example, 3D object uh, um, um, generative uh, models for uh, 3D objects were seen diffusion models. And uh, we also actually even supervised, uh, supervised uh, models are used for, for example, uh, Meta's uh, segment mo uh, segmentation model, uh, SAM. So transformer model is really uh, started with language based and uh, it's really uh, taking sequence data like uh, words or characters and try to predict the, the next uh, what we call token but you can think about think about it uh, like the next character the next word the next sentence so that that's fundamentally seeing the world in a in a tokenized uh, 3d uh, sorry 1d way whereas the diffusion model right now we're using for vision is really trying to estimate the 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 3d structure of the the uh, uh, visual world and trying to estimate the depth um, of, you know, when you see uh, pixels on, on images, how do you infer the 3D depth? Yeah. And in, in both cases, it's really training with large data sets, but it's just how the model behaves. Yeah, they, they are very different, but there's, you know, fundamentally, there's a lot of neural network uh, underneath, yeah. So Feifei, you just came out with a new book last week. Congratulations. Um, it's called The World's I See, Curiosity, Exploration, and Discovery at the Dawn of AI. Can you tell us what your book is about? This book is really about a uh, double helix story in the sense it's the coming of age of a scientist, happened to be a uh, immigrant and a woman, and uh, also the coming of age of AI. And uh, coincidentally, the coming of age of modern AI very much, uh, you know, is uh, intertwined with my own uh, journey. So I wrote this book in this double helix structure to tell the story of how I become an AI scientist um, and encourage the younger generation to, to um you know, learn about this and be fascinated about this, but also really tell the science of AI through this kind of storytelling. I mean, it is really such a fantastic book. And, and you really talk about the struggles of, of being an immigrant and how you found um, role models and inspiration from, from teachers, from, from Albert Einstein. Um, you know, can you share some of the, the tidbits from the book? Um, yeah, so... So I think this book has actually uh, many heroes, and uh, and they're not me. <laughs> it's that um, I wouldn't be where I am if my journey uh, did, wasn't filled with people who so generously and, and so bravely supported me. It began with my parents, especially my mom. The book uh, uh, was uh, very open about her uh, our struggle in, as immigrants, as well as she being, you know, quite ill most of the time because due to health uh, conditions. Yet, is such a um, um, just strong support for my pursuing this kind of quirky career path. <laughs> and and then and then I met my high school uh, math teacher and his family, Mr. Savella, and his entire family, who really took me in. Uh, in my um, toughest time because I was just a young immigrant kid trying to navigate American high school. And uh, they have supported me all my life till today. And then, you know, along the way, to make a scientist, it takes a community, right? My uh, advisors, my colleagues. So while it is still a struggle to be a woman in tech, it is it is, you know, our world still needs to improve. I do want to recognize all these people's uh, incredible support and uh, generosity. Well, and, and you you say with humility that you're not the hero, but you are, right? Because you you've you really seeded all of the deep learning work that has come since your initial um, days. You've continued to innovate, and you're such an inspiration and role model to me and, and so many others. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
on the the topic of you know your mother's health and you know you 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 started you were saying as an assistant professor at Stanford in 2006 you are now the co-director of of the AI Institute the Human Centered AI Institute which is just incredible you're continuing to lead such groundbreaking work in many fields across AI and I just want to talk about some of these you know one of the areas that you're very passionate about is is healthcare and AI could you tell us about the latest research that you're doing there yeah, happy to. And in fact, the book uh, talk about this. It really is um, um, coming from my own personal experience, having spent decades taking care of uh, um, my my parents and especially my mother across the entirety of America health healthcare system, from you know ER to operation to ambulatory to ICU to home care that I gained a lot of insights, not just on the technical level of what healthcare is about, but on the human level of how vulnerable and uh, patients are and how much work that uh, caretakers do and clinicians. So it, this experience led me um, about 12 years ago to reach out to my medical school uh, colleagues at Stanford and thinking about brainstorming about how vision, computer vision can help uh, our patients and uh, clinicians. And through this study, through some research, we realized um, medical error and the lack of uh, attention sometimes is uh, a leading, one of the leading causes of American patients' death and uh, injury, whether it's patient fall, or hospital acquired infection or you know other procedural errors and all of these are unintended so how can we help and we realize that uh, smart sensors be it cameras and, and other non-invasive sensors can function as a um, pair of extra eyes and almost guardian angel to help uh, remind uh, uh, patients and, and clinicians uh, and provide the insights. So we start developing this set of technology called ambient intelligence in healthcare conditions. For example, a smart camera can alert potential patient movements in ICUs to, to um, you know, help uh, keep an eye on uh, poten potential patient fall. You can use the same technology in the uh, aging home and help our elderly, especially those living independently. So this body of work is called ambient intelligence. And um, it's not that far from self-driving car technology. Yeah. It's just using sensors to sense environment, but in this case, it saves lives. Yes, it's such a powerful and impactful application of, of all the AI vision and sensory um, work that, that you've been doing. I just think about how that will just have transformative impact for every patient, every caregiver, every health healthcare provider in the coming years. Um, another area that, that another set of applications that you've done a lot of work in is in the robotics field. Can you talk about what's the latest and greatest there? Yeah, well, actually, I think we're seeing a lot of blossoming of uh, robotics work and also thanks to the connection with large language models. Well, here's the thing. Why do nature make eyes, right? Nature enabled animals to see, not to sit around and watch videos. <laughs> it's that animals, animals needed to move. They need to move to survive, to eat, to interact, to defend themselves, to hide. So perception fundamentally uh, engenders uh, action. So seeing is for doing. And once we realize that, there's a natural link between computer vision and robotic uh, robotics and robotic learning is that using that kind of grounded perceptual work to enable machines to move and interact. So that led me to robotics. And here we are looking at how to make robots to do a lot of uh, uh, um, helpful tasks to humans, everyday tasks, especially, you know, cleaning and, and all that. And it's just, um, um, e even in this field, we're seeing, you know, navigation robots, manipulation robots, robots that help patients, robots that help uh, uh, um, farming and all that. And I, I, I actually find this area incredibly exciting. And I think we're going to see a blossoming as we mature our uh, say, large language models and and uh, world models and, and all that. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, at Salesforce, we announced at Dreamforce our Einstein co-pilot, and that's 
for, for knowledge workers who deal with customers. But it doesn't just have to be knowledge workers, right? It's like you were saying, it could be farm workers, it could be healthcare workers, it could be manufacturing. Everybody could use a, a robotics co-pilot of some sort. <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree. And I really love this uh, uh, framing of co-piloting because a lot of AI's social implication is jobs, right? Um, here leading Stanford's uh, Human Center AI Institute, we care a lot about uh, about uh, um, how this is going to impact our, our, our work. On one hand, as technologists, we see productivity increase and there's a lot of excitement now in knowledge worker, but for all kind of work. But productivity increase doesn't necessarily translate to a smooth or or fair or or a, a good transition to workforce. So we do have to be very careful about how we design this technology and deploy it. I I really believe in um, technology, especially AI, is to enhance and augment humanity and uh, and co-pilot be it in the knowledge space or in the physical space, would be a great way of using this technology. Do you think that there's more that business leaders and, and policymakers should be doing to ensure that it's equitable and, and helpful for everyone? Uh, yes, I, I think that, um, uh, look, this technology is perhaps the most profound technology of 21st century. Uh, uh, and I think that all business, I mean, Clara, in your own role and many people, business leaders role are really doubling down and, and uh, all in, in AI in this process. I think we should take a human-centered approach. We should uh, um, really embrace partnership, um, both from business, but, but as well as uh, a thought leadership partnership point of uh, view uh, with, you know, uh, academia, public sector, government, because we have to put responsible use of this technology at the center of this. Yeah, and of course, the, the White House just came out with the, the first executive order on AI, and we, we were very proud to be part of, of the initial voluntary commitments from a number of leading AI companies. And so certainly an area that we will continue to invest in and work very closely with, with everyone from across the public and private sector and the academia, um, including yourself. So, of course, the, your, your human-centered AI institute, you've continued to, to really lead the charge on the work around foundational models with your benchmarks that are widely used and, and many other innovations. Um, can you talk about that also? Uh, yes. So one of the founding mission of the Human Centered AI Institute is to advance research, education, policy, and practice of AI. And I think as these powerful foundation models, langu large language models are rolled out into our society, it is actually public sector's uh, tremendous responsibility to help uh, usher and and guide as well as evaluate and assess these uh, uh, models. So back in 2021, 20, um, I believe, when GPT-2 was just barely released, we, uh, our researchers, especially led by our uh, natural language processing uh, team like Percy Leon, Chris Banning, uh, they recognized the importance of uh, the power of this uh, uh, large language model. So uh, they came to me and we um, uh, put together, uh, established, uh, the, the academic world's first center for research on foundation models uh, more than two years ago. And uh, one of the things that our center uh, has been doing is assessing these uh, large language models. As you know, not all of them are open, uh, but it's very important to understand what they do, both from a performance accuracy point of view, but as well as from bias, transparency, explainability, and uh, those point of view, uh, the, the, the one of the recent work our Center for Foundation Model has done is to uh, look at the EU AI Act and the Transparency Index and uh, benchmark uh, some of these models against that, that index. And uh, there's a lot more work to be done there. Yeah, well, it's it's very exciting, and and again, thank you on behalf of the entire AI community for for all the work that you're doing to really enable the the rest of us. Um, so, I, I, in closing, I want to go back to earlier. You were saying that your initial your epiphany around dry, around learning by data versus by handcrafted models it was really inspired by by children, and as we look to the future, I mean, children are our future. 
What are the, the new ways that we should be educating our kids and the next generation of leaders um, to really prepare them for this AI-driven world? Yeah, uh, that's a topic very dear to my heart since I'm an educator. Um, first of all, I think we uh, need to be inclusive. I think this technology is so important. We need to invite a young generation of all walks of life to understand this, to embrace this. And by being an AI leader doesn't mean you have to be a coder. You can be an AI leader. Uh, you can be an artist. You can be a policymaker. You can be a lawyer. You can be a doctor. And, and, and I think our young generation, especially those who are traditionally underserved and underrepresented, need to hear from many people that they have a huge role to play in guiding this technology or using this technology. I also think it's a very interesting moment in education itself, because uh, as ChatGPT and GPT-like technology passes all these standardized tests, it's important to recognize what education is about. Um, you know, our, if, if the goal of education is still to educate uh, our humans to pass these standardized tests, are we taking away so much precious human capital for doing more creative, innovative, and, uh, and thoughtful things. So I think this itself is an opportunity of reflection and, and uh, innovation. And also, um, another thing about education for young generation is what we call bilingual talents. And I don't mean English and Spanish. I mean tech and uh, humanity, tech and ethics, tech and, uh, um, and societal understanding, because um, this technology is so profoundly powerful. And today at Stanford, uh, our institute spearheaded uh, the embedded ethics program into some of our CS uh, curricula. And uh, I know other universities have been involved in doing that. And this is so important. I'm sure, Clara, when you were at Stanford, uh, we didn't have these in our curriculum. And my education didn't. As computer scientists and uh, engineers, we were not, uh, were not educated in this kind of uh, multifaceted way. And now we cannot afford to just, you know, seeing things from one perspective. You're so right. You know, when I was at Stanford, people, we labeled everyone either a techie or a fuzzy. And yeah. I agree with you today, everyone needs to be a techie and a fuzzy for us to really be able to navigate the, for, the future world. Yep. Well, it's just wonderful insights. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for all of your amazing contributions to the field. It's, it's really an honor and pleasure to, to talk to you, and I look forward to doing much more together and, and what, what else comes out of the Institute in the coming months and years. Thank you, Clara. Thank you for inviting me. Three takeaways for me. Number one, a lot of the innovations we're seeing in AI were inspired by nature and how children learn. Number two, AI leaders are not just technologists. We need lawyers, doctors, artists, manufacturing workers, everyone to think of themselves as an AI leader because in the future, we're all going to have co-pilots. Number three, education. As AI gets better and better at taking standardized tests, whether it's for grad school or undergrad, maybe it's time for us to rethink how we teach our kids and how we enable them to be more creative instead of just answering rote questions. Well, that's all for this week on Ask More of AI. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts and follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter. To learn more about Salesforce and AI, join our Ask More of AI newsletter on LinkedIn. Thank you and see you next time.